I think started on verse 14 last week. In John chapter 1. Yes, I've got, I think he's, he's got it. And I think I've just got notes there down to about the 20th verse. Jeremiah, you've got a microphone there. You can chime in any time you want to. Things, uh, a quick review, a review, uh, of course, the fact that John is so different, the, the, the flavor and the whole feeling of John is different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that is because John was written after the church was revealed to the Apostle Paul. The accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that had not occurred. Uh, the Apostle Paul got the revelation of the church around 58, 60 A.D., and uh, the Gospel of John was not written until about 85 to 90 A.D. So John is looking at it from the perspective of the revelation of the church where Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not. Matthew is about the, Jesus Christ as king. Luke about Jesus Christ uh, the servant. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Mark about the, uh, Jesus Christ the servant. Luke about Jesus Christ the son of man. And now we see Jesus Christ in John as the son of God. But rather than, uh, as in Matthew, where the Lord told the fellow who wanted to know how to get eternal life, the Lord told that fellow uh, to keep the commandments. You know the commandments, thou shalt do no murder, and blah, blah, blah. And John now, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth, see it changed. It went from keeping the commandments after the revelation of the church now, it's whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's, that's a, a big difference. That's why the flavor and the tone of John is very different than Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke. All right, now I know I've got my notes in here somewhere. Let me find them, and we'll, we'll get going here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man, and the light shineth in darkness, and the dar darkness comprehended it not. That's all we see. He was, there was a man uh, sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light, which that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. My, 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 the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ, the living Word of God. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Remember over there in Revelation, that name written on his head? The Word of God, Jesus Christ, became the visible image of the invisible God. You were born with a body, a soul, and a spirit you, because you were made in the image of God. How do, we, how do we know that? We have a body, soul, and spirit. The Bible says, I pray that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you've got a soul, you've got a spirit, and you've got a body. When Adam sinned, he lost the spiritual life, which was the image of God. He lost that spiritual image of God. And, and everyone since Adam, from the time uh, that Adam sinned, was born not in God's image, but in the image of Adam. It said, and Adam bare, Seth after, bare sons and daughters after his own image. 
That's after he fell. Don't say in the image of God. After his own image and after his own likeness. So then Jesus Christ shows up and he's referred to as the last Adam. Why is that? Because... From the moment Adam sinned and lost that image of God and that spiritual life, no one on earth had the image of God from Adam until Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ showed up, he's called the second Adam, the last Adam. So the first Adam is, uh, is of the earth, earthy of the earth. The last Adam is a quickening spirit. Quicken means to make alive. In Christ we have life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 1 John 5, 10, the passage there, it says, And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Duh. Not in religion. Not in good works. It's not in being kind to animals. It's in his Son. Want to go to heaven? you got to go in Jesus Christ. Got to go through Christ. He's a mediator. One God, one mediator between God and man. So it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Uh, God became one of us. Adam, Adam couldn't get the job done. An angel couldn't get the job done. He, God had to become an eternal sacrifice for us. Turn to Colossians 1, 14. Colossians 1, 14. I may have gone through this verse last week. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image. All right, here it is. The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus Christ showed up, and he has the image of God again. We talked about, oh, oh I wanted to mention this. We talked last week about this thing with whether or not Jesus Christ could have sinned. M.R. DeHaan wrote a book about it, and I think his son Richard DeHaan. But the Bible says, and, and there's uh, differences of opinion on this, but the Bible says that which is born of God cannot sin, for his seed remaineth in him. Now I know everyone's thinking, well, how about me? I'm born of God, but I still sin. Well, your body hadn't been redeemed. Once that body's re your soul and spirit has been redeemed and the sins of the flesh are not imputed to that new creature that is born of God, it can't sin, but that body of flesh is still subject to sin. But the sins of the flesh are now imputed to the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ. Am I making any sense to anyone? It says our lives are hid in God, hid with Christ in God, or hid in God with Christ. Forget how that's worded. But our lives are hid. Blessed is a man to whom God will not impute sin. Blessed is a man who God imputeth righteousness without works. That's that new creature hid in Christ. When God sees me, he sees the, the righteousness of his son. Sins of the flesh, it's already been paid for by Jesus Christ. They're imputed to him. I don't want to get too deep there, but let's, let's go on here. I've said that to say this. Yeah, he's wait, said we are to what we wait to wait for the redemption of the body. Hadn't been redeemed yet. In fact, Paul says about us that for he shall change our vile bodies into his glorious body. So God says our bodies are vile. Paul said, I know within me, within my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. But the soul and spirit, your soul. The spirit has, has been quickened, made alive again. You've got that image of God back in the form of the Holy Spirit that indwells you and knit together with the, your human spirit. And that's you have a, a spirit-filled soul now that belongs to God forever. That body of flesh, according to Colossians 2, is cut loose from that body of flesh with a spiritual circumcision. Colossians 2.10, down through there. Wow! pretty incredible the term that is used and you'll hear this term from time to time about the argument 
the debate over whether Christ could have sinned or not, the term is referred to as the impeccability of Christ. Familiar with that? Isn't that right? That's the term. The impeccability of Christ. Could he have sinned? We talked last week about the fact that uh, the geneticist will tell you that that uh, infant and an infant gets their blood makeup from the father. Jesus, who did Jesus get his blood from? His father, which is God, the Holy Spirit. There's no, no genetic flaws in his blood. And boy, we could spend a week on, on that thought right there. Okay. For by him who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. He and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, When he arose from the dead, he became the firstborn. That in all things he might have the preeminence, for to please the Father, that in him should all the fullness dwell. He became the firstborn, and then everyone who trusts Christ after that is placed into that body of Christ. He's the firstborn among many brethren. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, down around verse 16. We'll look at that. 2 Peter 1, down around verse 16, I think it is. The Bible says this, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount the son of God Jesus Christ and he became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory of God because he was God the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou at my right hand That's God the Father speaking to God the Son. God the Father called him, the Lord said to my Lord. Wow. They're both called Lord. John 17 and verse 5. The Lord in his holy uh, priestly prayer, prayer of intercession. That's a prayer you need to know about. That a prayer of intercession is a prayer that you're praying to intercede in someone else's behalf. Jim, Jim Byard has cancer. He may not survive it. We prayed over him tonight. And, and uh, a prayer of intercession. We asked God, said, God, if there's any way within your will that you could heal him, Lord, that you would heal him within your will, will we're praying that you would do that. See, the Bible says to come boldly before the throne of grace that you might receive help in the time of need. So we come boldly before God because he tells us to. And, and, and the prayer is, well, your will be done. The prayer is, God, if there's any way now within your will, we want you to do this. That's bold. Because the Lord tells us to be bold. Wow. And now, O Father, John 17, 5, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus Christ is eternal. Before Abraham, remember in the first part of John? The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. For Abraham was, I am. Now, even though as many as received him became sons of God, they're just one begotten of God. We talked a little bit about that. No one before was begotten of God. Now, God created Adam, but he wasn't, Adam was not begotten of God. 
The Holy Spirit came upon Mary and Jesus Christ was born of the Holy Ghost of God. Which is part of the Godhead. All right. John 3, 16. Talks about him being his only, only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now one of the things we've talked about when it comes to, uh, to Bible study. We believe the book. Everything else is subject to. To whatever. I take everything else in this life with a grain of salt. But when it comes to this book, I have a final authority. I've settled on the King James 1611 Bible for English speaking people because more souls have been saved out of it than all the others. And that to me showed me that the Holy Spirit has put his seal of approval on that text. So if that's not it, I don't know what to go by, but I'm going to trust this, I'm going to live by it, preach it, and I'll die by it. You need to have a final authority somewhere. Not, otherwise, you'll be searching the Internet all your life, Googling uh, different uh, doctrines that you hear about and trying to figure out what God has to say about them. I just believe what it says. Try to put it in context, rightly divide it, get the sense of it, and just believe it. I may not agree with it. I may say, wow, why would God do that? But I still believe it. And I go by what God says, not what I think he should have said. All right. Psalms 2. He said, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. You'll find that in Psalms 2. I'm not sure where that is down there. Psalms 2. Everybody have that verse out? So God said that he was his son, and this day had he begotten him. He's only begotten of God. Nobody else was begotten of God. What is it, 2 7? I've got Psalms right in front of me and I keep looking on. I, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. Capital S O N in your King James Bible. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. All right, turn to John uh, 3, 18. I think I have, I have all this down in the notes. John 3, 18, where he's also referred to as begotten of God. I'll soon be there. John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name, watch it, of the only begotten Son of God. So understand what that means. That's someone who is born of God, not created by God. Satan was a created being, is a created being. Satan was not eternal. He was a created, is a created being. Jesus Christ is eternal. He took on the form of a man and identified with us. So he would become a proper sacrifice. He had to, through sufferings, he had to learn obedience through suffering. God put him through that. There's a lot involved in that. When we get uh, Hebrews, we've talked about some of that. He learned obedience through suffering. 3.18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. See, over and over it's believing. Believing on him. Resting for reliance on him. Or believing in him. By way of him. Through him. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned. You remember uh, Rahab the harlot? Said she perished not. Over in uh, Hebrews 11, the, the hall of faith. She perished not with them that believed not. Which ones perished? The ones that didn't believe. Thought I'd throw that in. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, God stresses the fact, I've got here written in my notes, God stresses the fact that Jesus Christ is the only person 
physically begotten of God. And he uh, uh, quotes this statement from the Psalms again in Acts 13.33. Anybody there yet? Is anybody trying to go there? Acts 13.33. All right, let me find it. God hath fulfilled the same unto us. Their, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He's quoting Psalms 2 there. And then what other verse did I put down? Hebrews 1, 5. Go there quickly. Hebrews 1, 5. All right. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So God over and over again tells us that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of the Father. He wasn't created. He was born of the Holy Spirit of God. God's only begotten. All right. Let's go back to John. We'll look at verse 15. John 1, 15. And the word of 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now there, he, what he just do? He just, John, just referred back to his eternal existence and deity. He is preferred before me. I need to baptize you with water. But there comes one after me whose shoes I'm unworthy to latch. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. This was he of whom I spake, saying that he is cometh one after me. There cometh one after me who is preferred before me. That's Jesus Christ. He always was. He is. I am eternal. I am that I am. God is eternal. And man, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in that study a lot about the thing of God just always with us. No matter whatever happens in history, God is there. Now the debate is the future. What's that about? I don't know, but God said, I am he that that was dead, am alive, and, and behold, am, I, I was alive, was dead, now behold, I'm alive forevermore. He says, I'm he that, that is, that, and he that was, and that he that is to come. I mean, something's going to happen in the future. Don't say it already happened yet. I don't want to promote any doctrine. I'm wrestling with the same thing here about, about future events. But I do know God is always present. David said, you can't get away from him. He said, if I make my bed in hell, thou art with me. Wherever I'm at, thou art with me. Always present. So here verse 15 refers, to, refers back to his eternal existence with God and that he is God. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. <clears throat> And of his fullness have we all, have all we, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Fullness, Colossians 1.19, talking about his fullness. Colossians is really an exciting book to get into. I remember those books like uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians. Uh, Philippians and Colossians, you know how I remember them? General Electric Power Company. See where I'm going? Galatians is first. 
Ephesians is second, Philippians is third, Colossians is last, general, that's how stupid I am. That's the kind of mental tricks I have to play with myself to remember where something's at. Okay, I'm going over to the power company now. Colossians what? <laughs> you don't feel bad about that, huh? All right. Colossians 1.19, talking about this fullness. He says, Colossians 1.19, For it please the Father that in him, that's in Jesus Christ, should all the fullness dwell. The Bible says with Jesus Christ, God not withheld uh, not the spirit from him by measure. Man, he had it all. He had, he had. Now, there's, a, some, there's something you'll find in Scripture that Jesus Christ didn't always invoke his deity. I mean, he knew everything, but he would walk, he would, he would submit himself, become a servant, and walk as a man. But he would invoke his deity when it was necessary for him to. And how do I get that? When he perceived, if he knew it already, he didn't have to perceive it. He already had perceived it. But it says, when he perceived this, when he didn't it. So it would, it would be invoked by our Lord when he needed to be in, invoked. When he perceived their thoughts. Well, didn't he know their thoughts already? Well, he humbled himself as a man and didn't carry that deity with him. All the, He slept. He ate. God don't have to sleep. He slumbereth not nor sleeps. But Jesus Christ slept. Everything man would do, Jesus Christ did. Except sin. But it seems like he would... And isn't there a, a theological term for that? Of what? Doctrine of the kenosis. Doctrine of the Doctrine kenosis? Of kenosis, like canoe, but kenosis. Kenosis, okay. I knew there's some theological term, but it's that, that he had, he submitted himself as a man. Now, something happened. I'm not sure. Nobody's sure. When the Lord on the cross, he says, turn and said, my God, my God. I wonder why I said that twice, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. I don't know, maybe. Why hast thou forsaken me? I don't know, maybe, maybe God allowed him, maybe God let him know that you've got to make that decision as a man. I'm not going to make, I'm not going to make that, I don't know. Does that make sense? I'm going to let you make that decision on your own as a man. My God, why have you forsaken me? Because he willingly chose to go to the cross. Others say, well, he turned to God and had to turn his back on him because he couldn't look on sin. But the Bible says the eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good. I don't know. You got any thoughts on that, Brother Jeremy? Just, you know, a sacrifice, like in the Old Testament, a lamb. Somebody had to slay that lamb. Yeah. Willingly. I think it was God that he said that. He said, can you lift it up and say, wow. Willingly lay it down, but God was the man that says, I'll sit and set them up. Yeah. The wrath of God fell on Jesus Christ. He took, took our sins for us. Wow. Fullness. It pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. That's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Jehovah Witnesses don't teach that. They say Jesus Christ wasn't God. He's a lesser God. They denied what this verse just said. He had all the fullness of God. The Lord said unto my Lord. He, the Bible says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. I mean, if you believe the book, it's pretty convincing that Jesus Christ is God. Yeah, use your microphone. The verses that when you show them, to show them, I've been in them, I've been with them, and they just, they don't know what to say. 
Now, I had some visit here about a month ago. And I, I said, no, I, I disagree. I, I, my trust is in Jesus Christ as God, not God number two, not a lesser God. For he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And the Lord said to Mike, said, those, they got in their car and left. Use that mic when you chip in. All right. All right, where are we? John 3, 18, he's called the only begotten son. Verse 15 refers to his eternal existence and deity. We're in verse 16, a grace for grace. Grace for grace. Now, that, I've got written down that grace is inexhaustible and sufficient to meet every recurring need. But there's something going on, I suspect, from grace to grace when it went from the law, the grace given under the law, to grace through Jesus Christ. You notice it talks about from glory to glory. There was a glory of the law. And then it says how much more, more glorious when Christ shows up. So from grace to grace. Maybe talking about coming from the law. There's grace. There's grace actually all the way across the board. In all the ages it involves grace. It's God's grace. But there's different covenants in order to access that grace. Told the Jew, you gotta keep told the Jew, you gotta keep the commandments. To do that, I'll give you my righteousness. Abraham told Abraham, the Bible says Abraham believed God and it counted, he counted it to him for righteousness. That's grace. From grace to grace. I'm not sure. That that that's a very interesting verse. And let me see what uh, Alan, David Allen Hoffman says about that. But I, I, I've, I've, I've talked about that verse. I think I called uh, Brother Phil Gabbard about that verse at one time. And that's uh, grace to grace is where in, in verse 16. Let's see if we've got it here. Now... You'll find a lot of those commentators you read that you'll get to one verse where you really want to know what they have to say about it and they skip over the thing. It happens every time. Scared to make a, afraid somebody's going to criticize. <laughs> oh well. Verse 17. For the law was given by Moses. Okay, there's one grace. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. All right. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. See, the law condemns. The law condemned man in relationship to God's holiness. The law condemned him. Paul said, I had not known sin except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. The law showed him that what he, things that he thought were sin, showed him where God's boundaries were. But grace and truth came in the person of Jesus Christ. Romans 10 4, the, 10, 4, the Bible says, For the Christ is the end of the law. We talked about that. For righteousness to everyone that believeth. You bypass the law whenever you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If you're going to live by the law, you're going to be judged by the law. You trust Jesus Christ, he already took your judgment. And your righteousness is found in him. All right, I'm not going to get as far as I thought it was. Uh, the law manifested what uh, uh, was in man, and that's sin. Romans, uh, it was in Romans uh, 10, 4, there before that. The law uh, manifested what was in man, and that's sin, and grace manifested what was in God. That's love. Contrast between the two. The law demanded righteousness from man, and grace brings righteousness to man. The law speaks of what man must do for God and grace tells us what Christ has done for man. The law gives a knowledge of sin but grace offers the putting away of sin. Hey, if they took all the speed limit signs down out here you could drive as fast as you want to. There's no law against it, why not? Duh. 
you're not under the law, you're not under the law. You can go as fast as you want to. Lonnie does anyway. <laughs> I don't know, Tammy had a kind of funny look on her. Maybe it's Tammy that drives. The law gives a knowledge of sin. Grace offers the putting away of sin. The law brought, about, uh, brought out God to man and grace brought men to God. Verse 18, where are we? John 1, 18. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, capital S-O-N, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now this verse, uh, in my notes here, say that this verse terminates the introduction of, of John's gospel and, he, and it summarized the whole of the first 18 verses of John 1. No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. All right, it, uh, it speaks of the intimacy of the Holy Trinity of God, that how intimate that they are, the Holy Spirit, uh, God the Father, God the Son, they all agree in one and the in, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and three that bear witness in earth, the water, the blood, and the Spirit. Man, I started a study on that years ago, never did get through it. Some pretty complicated uh, stuff there. All right. In the past, uh, the person of God was unmanifested. Uh, in a lot of that Old Testament, there was not much mention of the Trinity at all. It doesn't understand it. didn't know about it. Now, Brother Greg Eastep says that, that the Trinity, God kind of separated maybe for the redemption of man. That's kind of a weird thought to be thinking. But you didn't hear about the Trinity back in the Old Testament. They didn't hear about God the Father, God the Son. Hmm. The person of God was unmanifested. It said, no man hath seen God at any time, but now. Isn't that good? But now the Son hath declared him. See, this is all new to the Jew. This was all brand new stuff to the Jew that John's preaching. Christ, the visible image of the invisible God. Verse 19, and this is the record of John. When the Jews sent uh, priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? The record, he said he was a voice. Matthew 11, 11, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I don't know. I don't. I, I have a lot of speculation on that verse. It may be because he's still subject to the flesh. He was the greatest among men, but the one that's in the kingdom of heaven is better off than he is. I don't know. You got any thoughts on that? Uh, Jesus said in John 14, uh, 28, he said, "My Father is greater than I." Now, A.W. Pink said this. He said, greater not in his person, but in his position. For at the time the Savior uttered those words, he was in the place of subjection. He had submitted himself. He had humbled himself and became in the form of a servant. That's why he's saying, where I am now as a man born of a woman... My father is greater than I. Maybe that's, that sounds reasonable to me. Why he made that, that's, that, that sounds reasonable? Why he made that statement. At the time that the Savior uttered those words, he was in the place of subjection as God's servant, positionally in the form of a man. John the Baptist then positionally was still a mortal, while the least in the kingdom of heaven was greater than he. That's kind of the best I can do on that. All right, verse 20. And we'll be done here in just a second. And he confessed and denied not. That's when they asked him, who art thou? 
And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. John the Baptist never let on like he was the Christ anytime, anywhere. Uh, John was considered, when John came about, the religious crowd didn't like John. I think I have written there, he was considered an interloper. Is that the right pronunciation? They, did, they, they didn't want him around. <laughs> and, you know, he wore camel's hair and had the long hair. He looked rough. He was a hippie. The religious crowd didn't like him. He wasn't a Pharisee. He wasn't a Sadducee. The Sadducees taught that there was no resurrection. There's always a difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Both of them were religious punks. They, I don't know, this little streak comes out in me from time to time. He hadn't been taught in their schools. He hadn't ministered in their temples. Where did John the Baptist come from? Next thing he'll tell us that this carpenter's kid's the Savior. Yeah. <laughs> Who art thou? He confessed, I am not the Christ. All right, it's time to quit. I love this study. John will set you free, boy. It's just so good, so rich, outrageous. Any questions? Jeremiah, you got your mic there. Any questions? What we've talked about so far? No, everybody wants to go home. Yes, Zacharias. His father was Zacharias. You'll read about Zacharias and Elizabeth there in the first part of Luke. And, and a, a lot of them will date the birth of Christ uh, by the birth of John the Baptist. And they figure out the birth of John the Baptist. It was six months before Jesus Christ, John the Baptist was born. Isn't that how, right? And, and, and they go by the courses that the priests did. There were 12 courses of priests for uh, to do the, the work of the temple for the priest. And each course was a, a, a certain period of time, like a month of time, and, and they, they figured the course that Zacharias had, and they measured that in, in some way. I've, I've never studied that out. They figured out about the time of the Lord's birth because he's born six months after John the Baptist. And they say if they figured out when John the Baptist was born, they could figure out when the Lord was born. Uh, in Luke 1, the verse 5 it talks, talks about John the Baptist, mom and dad, Elizabeth and Zacharias. It, it says that they, uh, they kept all the statutes, and they were righteous before God and kept all the statutes and the ordinances blameless. That's a verse we use to show that, that those Old Testament sacrifices that they did didn't say they were sinless. But when they kept the sacrifices that God told them to keep, they were blameless. Now, as concerning the law, blameless. As concerning the righteousness of the law, blameless. You know why it was blameless? Because he did what God told him to do. You know why the Jew was considered blameless? Why Elizabeth and Zacharias were blameless? Because they kept the sacrifice. Now when the Lord showed up, all the Jews are looking, uh, they, they, weren't, they should have been looking for the, to the sacrifice rather than the big military hero they were looking for as a savior. They, they never thought about the sacrifice part of the Lord's work. He came as a sacrifice for mankind. And it's pictured through all those Old Testament sacrifices. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for your mercy and goodness and grace. Thank you for all those who have come out tonight, Lord. Thank you for this exciting study, Lord, and your word. Man, we're so thankful for your word, Lord. And thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us and help us to have an understanding about it. And we'll just praise you and give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow. Wow. Amen.